with our strategic partners, Center Maryland, Pressbox, as well as our new strategic partner, the Greater Baltimore Committee. My name is Gregory Pullman, publisher of Carter Inc. and CarterInc.com, the premier news source for business and politics up and down Maryland's cyber highway. We're thrilled to have such a wonderful crowd here today to learn about the latest in cybersecurity and economic opportunities being presented in this booming sector of Maryland's economy. We'd like to begin by thanking the sponsors of this conference. The silver sponsors are Hartford County Office of Economic Development, Morgan State University, and SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation. The gold sponsors are Anne Arundel Community College, COP, Corporate Office Properties Trust, and the Economic Alliance of Greater Baltimore. And the platinum sponsor for today's conference is Mantech International, leading the convergence of national security and technology. Please let's show uh, our appreciation for our sponsors with a round of applause. We also want to express our gratitude for today's sponsor and host, the Hotel at Arundel Preserve. This is a gorgeous new hotel with a very convenient location. Breakfast has been fabulous, and the entire staff here has been professional, gracious, and accommodating. Our hats off here to all the staff here at the Hotel at Arundel Preserve. At the conclusion of today's conference, we'll be awarding door prizes. You must be present to win, so please make sure you stay and be eligible to receive today's gifts. And now, I'd like to present the chairman of Corridor Inc., Mr. Ted Benatoulis. Thank you very much, Greg. <clears throat> And I want to thank all of you for coming, uh, in spite of the weather. Uh, uh, it's a worthy subject, and we're just delighted that you're here. Um, I want to also express our appreciation to the hotel. They've done a wonderful job. They are new, and they've just done a terrific job in what they've, what they've got here. Uh, <clears throat> in a few months, you'll be able to stay at this hotel, walk right across the street, and David Cordish and his company will be happy to help you part with your money. Just a short walk. Uh, but you can understand the convenience of, of this hotel to the mall and to what's happening around here. <clears throat> there are a couple of, uh, we've got a long program, so I want to move it along. Um, we do have some folks here I do want to make sure I recognize. Uh, one of the members of the county council here in Anne Arundel County uh, is with us, James Benoit. James, stand up so folks can see you. <laughs> There are a lot of officials here, but there's one I want to uh, uh, personally uh, recognize because we're literally in his home ter territory, and that's Paul Wiedenfeld, who is the director of the Baltimore-Washington International Airport, a great airport, Paul. It really is a magnificent airport. It's one of our hidden secrets, and uh, it shouldn't be so secret. It really is terrific. Thank you, Paul. Okay, we're going to start. We... Um, let me just run through quickly. This subject area is one that lay folks like myself have 
trouble understanding. I have a 12-year-old daughter, and that helps in terms of all the computer and technology that, that, that takes place. But here's a subject that we have broken down into two categories and have developed panels for both. One on the cybersecurity aspect of it, the other on the cyber jobs and technology and the opportunities of venture capital, whatever is out there. We have a great panel, and we have some great speakers. But this whole thing from, uh, uh, from hacking, from intrusion, from privacy, from foreign countries whacking in, from corporations whacking each other, from uh, privacy, from kids in school um, uh, intruding on themselves, the cyberbullying that goes on that I know the Attorney General was, uh, was uh, been focusing on. Um, to kids in a garage who may decide that they want to hack somebody. I mean, it's just a, an incredible arena. And then there's all these wonderful opportunities we have out there for, 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 for business expansion, for initiative, and for capital and the economy of, and jobs for our state. We've invited um, our first speaker to welcome you and say a few opening remarks uh, is the uh, is Doug Ganster, the governor, the attorney general of the state of Maryland, uh, an old friend, and I'd like to introduce him. Freud would have a field day with you, Ted. Um, thank, thank you, Ted, uh, for being here. Whacking, by the way, is the thing you do with whack-a-mole, um, to those of you who don't know. Exactly. And uh, thank you all for being here. This is obviously critical to our state and the future, and thank you, Dutch Ruppersberg. I know uh, you're here somewhere. Dutch is a great irony because he's on the Senate, uh, he's on the House uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, which you don't always hear about from former Maryland lacrosse players, and uh, John Sarbanes as well, uh, being here on, from the Science and Technology Committee, so, so his presence here is relevant as well. You know, um, just listening to Ted, you, you think about Maryland being uniquely positioned in this field. You know, we, we, I think we're uniquely positioned in two different areas, biotech and cybersecurity. If you think of Idaho, you think potatoes, you think New York, you think financial institutions. Uh, California, you can think of films. But here, we have the number one uh, public school education in the country. We have the most advanced degrees in the country. We're the, the wealthiest uh, per capita income in the country. And we're on the outskirts of Washington, D.C., where the NSA is, the University of Maryland, and I, uh, George uh, Peterson would, be, would go to my father and uh, say something if I didn't mention him. He was a former Under Secretary of Defense and is very uh, deep into this cybersecurity area at the University of Maryland. They're doing great things there. We need to obviously continue to work on our tech transfer uh, from the University of Maryland. But uh, the reason why I think Ted uh, asked me to say a few words is because the Attorney General actually collectively are becoming the police of the internet, if you will. You know, the local state's attorneys or DAs uh, do street crime, murder, rape, arson. The federal government is particularly concerned as they ought to be with terrorism and homeland security. And we've become really uh, the, the police of the internet on so many different fronts. Um, and our, our office has done a number of things. We just most recently took uh, the human trafficking element away from Backpage.com. We were able to shut down a, a website called peoplesdirt.com that was uh, really kind of getting into people's privacy issues. And we, were, uh, we worked with MySpace and Facebook to get, get age verification for children to be on there and to get sexual predators off of those uh, particular sites. So we're going to continue uh, to work on a number of issues that relate to privacy. Uh, one of them, for example, that we just concluded was a, a thing called LimeWire. I don't know if any of you have kids or grandkids that uh, all of a sudden have music on their computer. They used to ask you for songs at 99 cents a piece, then they stopped. Um, they're all on LimeWire or FrostWire, which is, depending on your view of piracy, is, is fine or not fine. But what they do is when they are taking a song and putting it on their, on their computer, they're literally pulling private information from the computers where they drew the song from. So that other people's tax returns and, and personal information comes onto your computer. So we, you've in, they've inadvertently joined a peer-to-peer -peer network for you. So we uh, put that to an end. The last thing I'll say, because uh, I know every sell, syllable cost me a vote for uh, Ted's job that he was talking about. Um, <laughs> I, uh, be, I'm president-elect of NAG, the National Association of Attorneys General. It's kind of an unfortunate acronym, um, but the. Uh, 
each year there's a, there's a presidential initiative. And the president of the organization, I, I take over in June, actually in Alaska, which is kind of odd. But uh, my pre this year's presidential initiative is human trafficking. Last year was financial institutions, since we're all, all 50 of us are suing the banks over mortgage foreclosure issues. My uh, issue is going to be privacy and the internet. And we're going to look at a number of issues involving privacy in terms of identity theft, what they're doing with your information when you buy something, say, on Amazon.com, who's getting that information, is that OK, is it not OK, should you know about it? Um, intellectual property security to protect the American businesses abroad is an issue that we're going to be uh, tackling. And cybersecurity is, is one of those issues. When you think of the Department of Defense website being ha attempted to be hacked into 30,000 times a day, then you certainly, uh, that's, a, that's an issue in terms of privacy for companies to be able to protect the integrity of their website. Some of the bigger ones spend an enormous amount of money policing their own websites and making sure that they are protected by the firewalls, but not everybody can stop the hackers. The technology can, keeps advancing. So that's an area that we're going to grapple with down the road, and we're going to have a conference here in the state of Maryland. So with that, I will uh, turn over the mic, and uh, thank you, Ted, for, for having me. And uh, you want me to introduce somebody, or are you going to do it? Ted's going to take care of it. Ted's a politician who wants to get back into it someday, so he'll be back up here. Uh, one of the things I love about Doug, he understands the word brevity. Perfect. Um, our next uh, a, a speaker who wants to offer some uh, welcoming remarks and some comments sits on the Science and Technology Committee of the House of Representatives, which is perfect for what we're doing today. Uh, he's uh, just a terrific congressman, uh, uh, John Sarbanes. John? Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Ted and Carter, Inc. Uh, this is a terrific uh, organization. I haven't quite figured out exactly what Carter, Inc. is, but I know it's a great place to be um, and network. And um, all the right people seem to be here. So you're doing something right, Ted. Um, I'll just take a few moments. Uh, this is obviously an exciting time for the state when it comes to this cybersecurity and all the opportunities that are attendant on it. And uh, you all know, so I don't, have to go, I don't have to go through it, the ingredients that are in place here. I mean, we have, we have all of the agencies that you would need to stand up uh, this incredible opportunity in terms of cyber uh, security. We have all of the business here. We have businesses that have been here for a long, long time that are in this space. We have a lot of new companies that are coming uh, to Maryland because they see the opportunity uh, that is presented here. So. Um, everything is converging, right? Um, you have the public sector organizations and agencies. You have the private sector uh, partners that are here in place. And it's all about building this security infrastructure for the country. I mean, Maryland is really at the center of this, and you're at the center of this, which means you're part of a larger agenda, which I've been talking about a lot these days, which is rebuilding the country, period. I mean. If you look around us, that's got to be the number one program we have, to rebuild the country, make it strong again. And that means investing in physical infrastructure, investing in human capital, investing in building strong communities, uh, and investing in our security infrastructure, which has so many dimensions that you're going to, of course, hear about today uh, from these excellent panels that have been uh, pulled together. But I do want to point out I think uh, the, the blinking red light here, because we, we tend to talk, I mean, when you hear people refer to the uh, cybersecurity command here and to the huge opportunities that are being uh, presented, there's always this asterisk. And the asterisk is making sure we find the people to do these jobs. We talk a lot about the jobs, right? We're creating all of these new job opportunities in all of these various career categories. But we got to get the people uh, to fill these jobs. And Maryland's got a head start on that because we do, as Doug was saying, we've got um, a tremendous education uh, system here. But we got to start building the collaborations that will ensure that the pipelines are here to provide these people. And, you know, I worked for the State Department of Education for about eight years at one point. 
And I was there when the, the new Thornton formula for funding education in the state of Maryland was developed. And the promise of that for Baltimore City, which I was focused on in particular, was, okay, there's going to be a lot more money available to help Baltimore City schools. So Baltimore City sat down and started planning out, you know, all of these things, these deficits that had existed, how can they address them now? So we're finally going to be able to get counselors in the high schools. Every high school will have a sufficient number of career counselors. We're going to be able to get psychologists in the middle schools and so forth. And they laid out these plans. So money wasn't the problem, and the vision wasn't missing. But it turned out there just weren't enough people qualified people to fill those positions. So you had the plan of where you needed to go, but you didn't have the people. We passed a health care reform bill last year, which I'm a big champion of. One of the things it did was it, it's turning our health care system towards prevention and primary care, which is going to be better for patients and it's going to save a lot of money. But guess what? There's already a shortage of 50,000 primary care physicians across this country. So we're creating a new system and a whole set of opportunities, but we need to get the people. It's the exact same thing in this space, and you know it because you're competing for these highly skilled people. You want to get folks that have the skill sets. You want to make sure that they have the security <coughs> clearances and so forth. And if we don't all collaborate to create a robust pipeline of these skilled people. We're going to end up with folks poaching people from each other. This happens already between the private sector and government and within the private sector. So I guess my message here is this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity, but we have to think out of the box starting yesterday on how to collaborate to make sure that we're building this pipeline. And that means reaching out, as has begun to happen, There's a, there was a $5 million Department of Labor uh, grant that the delegation helped get, where you've got community colleges in this region and high schools and others, uh, you know, workforce um, investment boards collaborating to produce a pipeline of highly skilled people. But that's, the goal is to get 1,000. You're going to need 5,000, 10,000 in the coming years. So businesses need to step out, figure out how to collaborate with each other and create kind of a consortium around the skills so that that pipeline is there. Otherwise, all these great opportunities are going to go for nothing. So that's kind of my encouragement to you to focus on that particular slice of this uh, story going forward. I know you'll do it because Maryland always steps up, and this is going to be a very successful experiment. Thank you all very much. Well, for, for John's edification, and for most of you, Carter Inc. is a media company <laughs> that covers uh, the, all the activity that takes place in the corridor from Montgomery and Prince George's County through Anne Arundel and Howard and the city and Hartford County and uh, Cecil County, that whole vast I-95 BRAC cyber corridor, and uh, with magazine, with a 24-hour website, and with... Uh, uh, conferences and some strategic partners. So John, that ought to uh, educate you a little bit on what we do, or at least what we try to do. We're going to move to our first panel, which will then be followed by our keynote speaker, uh, the, the distinguished Dutch Ruppersberger. But let's, um, this first panel will focus on all the cybersecurity and intelligence and spying and hacking and all the things that uh, many of us kind of associate with uh, cyber uh, activity. Um, and we have an illustrious panel. Our first panelist, who is uh, seated here, let me make sure I've got him in some reasonable order here. Is James Scobie. Uh, Jim is the Chief Operations Officer and Chief Technology Officer for the Federal Data System. Uh, Jim, why don't you start off? I'd like the panelists to each take about five or seven minutes to kind of talk about what's on their minds and what you think the audience might be interested in from your perspective. Um, we can decide at the end of each panel, certainly the first panel, whether we want to offer some question and answer. I do want to have a, a question and answer period at the end when both panels 
have had an opportunity to talk, but we can perhaps have one uh, with each panel as well. So Jim, why don't you start off, okay? There's a mic right there that you can use. It should be on. Good morning. Is it on? Uh, I don't think so. Make sure the others are on too. Uh. Good morning. Go into it. Uh, good morning. So I don't know how many of you woke up this morning and checked the news before you came, but uh, in the wee hours of the morning this morning, the hacker group Anonymous uh, posted the intent to make September 24th a National Day of Vengeance and uh, to attack the New York City Police Department, Wall Street institutions, and uh, banks inside the United States. Um, it's, if you didn't know about that before, you're welcome for letting, me know, for letting you know what's going to consume the rest of your day. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they say a ship that is safe in harbor, uh, but that's not what we build ships for. Uh, and that's true of information technology as well. Uh, IT information, any information, is only as good as our ability to use it. And our ability to use it is predicated on our ability to share it effectively. Um, the, the problem with that is all cyber exploitation is based on one form or another of uh, abusing a trust relationship. Um, the Attorney General brought up LimeWire this morning, and that's a key example of abusing a trust relationship. Uh, that computer that your son or daughter has has now brought in a, a Trojan into your house uh, that can be used to exploit other networks, government networks. Uh, it's a key problem we deal with in maintaining the usability of the system while still sharing information in an effective manner. It's made worse uh, in government IT because historically one of our best protections against these sorts of things has been compartmentalization of information. Um, that predates IT. Uh, it's just the way we've always dealt with data. But while we're dealing with the compartmentalization, we have to be able to share it effectively too. Um, we live in an age where the Internet's conditioned everyone to expect immediate access to full data. Um, we haven't done an amendment to the Constitution on that yet, but the Tea Party's still at work on it, I'm sure. Um, the, the dilemma we face is that we need to build a system that's infinitely secure, provides the right data to the right people at the same time, and uh, while you're at it, make sure it's cheap, too. Um, defense is hard. It's much harder than offense. Uh, our best plans today tend to go toward preventing intrusion, and I'm sure a lot of people's days are going to be spent preventing the intrusion of the hacker group Anonymous and what they announced. Um, but what we're not so good at is planning for what happens when we do have a breach. Um, the information security officer that brags that he's never had a network he's responsible for penetrated is probably the last person you want defending your network, because anybody who thinks they're invulnerable in this climate is wrong and dangerous. Um, so, finally, with the, the current economic climate, we have to embrace cost savings as well as uh, enhanced security. The federal government plans on consolidating between 650 and 800 data centers uh, across its enterprise, depending on who, who you listen to. Uh, OMB thinks that's going to be about $700 million in savings. If we do that the wrong way, then we're going to create new security vulnerabilities for groups like Anonymous to attack. If we do it the right way, we enhance security and uh, we make everybody better off while still saving money. Um, so there's three design principles that, while well, I've got this group of technical people here, I want to talk about uh, very briefly and uh, go over. Uh, one is secure multi-tenancy. We've all heard a lot about the cloud over the last couple of years uh, and cloud-first initiative and embracing the Google model and the Amazon model. The problem goes back to trust, like I was talking about, and the compartmentalization of information, because that is inherently adverse to the cloud model. Um, instead, what we should be striving for is secure multi-tenancy, where we reduce ourselves to a single set of infrastructure, but we still keep compartmentalized information between those boundaries. And that works well with, uh, our, that works well with maintaining the accreditation of our existing networks while not expanding our trust horizon any. Um, it can be done, and there's ways that we're doing it today. 
Uh, the next thing is protect the data first and the network second. For years, we had a mentality of protecting the borders of our network and assuming that no one would ever get inside of them. Uh, and so it was the, uh, the hard exterior and the soft, chewy center mentality where once an attacker got inside the network, it was owned. Um, that's changing, but it's not changing slowly and it's not changing quickly enough. One of the opportunities we have is with the data center consolidations that are going on, we're doing much, much denser data processing, uh, which means the total number of square footage in data centers is condensing down to a very small number. Um, that's an opportunity and it's a threat and it's something we all need to address. Um, the best thing that can happen from that is when you reduce your attack uh, surface in a data center, if you instrument it properly, you can make the best use of it. Uh, the third is uh, knowledge is power, it's hackneyed, but it's true. Um, many of you are engaged in cybersecurity related engineering services. The bad news is it's no longer okay to be just a good engineer in one specific technology. Um, unless you have a much broader view, you're not going to be able to detect the threats that are coming out of each and every one of these vectors. Uh, as an example, it's not okay to be just a good C++ programmer anymore. You have to be a good C++ programmer and you need to know the environment that your code's running in because your ability to detect threats and do an effective threat assessment is much better as an engineer than uh, an information assurance person has who's going off a script or doesn't know the technologies as deeply as you are. And uh, there's a number of partners here today. I've worked with several alums from Anne Arundel Community College's cyber program. Um, those are good efforts, they're not quite enough. We need to standardize those. DOD implemented Directive 8570, uh, which standardized security training for all IT professionals. Uh, it's a good start, but it needs to extend beyond just the federal government, and uh, that's something that the state and business needs to work with the federal government on. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. I don't know if that mic works over there, but you know, our next uh, guest panelist is Neil Ziering who is a technical director of information assurance directorate at the National Security Agency. Um, Neil, I don't know if that mic works over there. They do? All right, let's get it over there. You want to start? Oh, what happened to him? I'm sure Neil is probably responding to the threat that was identified. Aha, all right. <laughs> okay, um, our next speaker then will be, um, let's see, who do we have here? I'm sorry, how about Terry Leary? who is the new director of the cybersecurity uh, uh, department over at the Anne Arundel Community College. Carrie, why don't you go ahead. Sure, absolutely. I, I feel like I could talk about this forever in so many different aspects, just as I think many of the panelists could as well. So I picked one specific one to share with you today. Um, and that's really the people. I, I agree with uh, every, everything that's been said this morning. So the people is the biggest problem. We have a human capital crisis in the nation right now. And how we're going to address it is, I think, going to determine whether or not we're prepared to meet these attacks and to defend against them. The one specific thing of work I want to share with you that's happening right now that I think everyone in this room could get involved in is out of the President Obama's cybersecurity policy, the National Institute of uh, Science and Technology, NIST, created the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE, all acronyms. Um, you can go to the NIST website and access the NICE um, information. They created four component areas to this initiative. The first is just general cybersecurity awareness. Our, your normal people who weren't working in this industry, how do we make them aware about the vulnerabilities at home, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses that maybe just aren't dealing in this specific uh, cybersecurity arena, but that also need to know about awareness. But one, one big thing that's happening is component area four the Department of Homeland Security has worked with all of the federal agencies as well as the private sector, um, some subject matter experts to define what cybersecurity is. I think what the problem in, is in the United States is that we're all using different terms and if we could get some sort of standardization to it, maybe we don't really agree that their definition is exactly right, but if we can move in the direction to the point where we're all using the same terms, I think it will help better make us meet these, um, th these critical things that we're facing. So what they did was, out of all these conversations, they came up with 31 job titles. Um, they identified what 
the job titles they are. Again, you have a sysadmin at one company might be doing something than a sysadmin at another. And the whole goal is if we could start identifying what the knowledge and skills abilities are in general for a sysadmin, then we could start to all get on the same page with the standardization of terms. They're currently seeking feedback. So if anyone in this room would like to give feedback, I think this would be the time to go to the website, take a look at the framework, take a look at the job roles, see how they're gonna affect you, see if you agree with them or if you see that there are any glaring um, holes in it that need to be fixed uh, so that they can take this feedback and they put it in. And I share this with you for a couple reasons. One, on the education front, we're prepared to train people. Um, both the, the typical student that you're thinking that's coming out of high school into a two-year school and into a four-year that wants to major in cybersecurity, we're prepared for them, we're prepared for the <coughs> workforce that's coming back to retool, we can train them, but what we need to know is what the needs are. And so what the framework is trying to do is seek feedback from everyone in this room to say, okay, these are the job roles, we agree with those. And then the second step is they're gonna take those job roles and they're gonna seek your feedback on what holes are missing. Where do you need workforce at? What specific job roles are you looking for? And that will help education because we can start to point these students in the direction of those jobs that are hiring. Right now there's a lot of speculation, there's 30,000 jobs, there's 60,000 jobs, where are they and when, what specific things? Are they forensics? Are they cybersecurity? Are they system admins? Do we need more managers? It's a lot of talk right now, but no one's ever put the numbers down to exactly how many do we need. And so if you can give that feedback to them and then roll out and take a look internally on where you're missing, Education, what we can do is start to get rid of the programs that we don't need and start to create new curriculum in areas that you do need so we can make sure that we're getting you the people that you um, need to fill these slots so that we can protect the nation. Thank you, Kerry. Our next panelist is Hart Rossman, who is the Vice President and Chief Technology, Technology Officer for Cybersecurity Services and Solution at SAIC. Hart. I think it's important that we talk about threat and vulnerability, but I also think it's equally important, if not more so, that we spend a little bit of time talking about the opportunity in this space and where we can apply innovation and entrepreneurship in order to be successful in defending against the threat and closing up the vulnerabilities that we have before us. Uh, the internet was really founded as a communications infrastructure. and. That has evolved from a state of information sharing and being able to link between documents and between pages on the internet into a real social media. And if you look today at what's driving innovation on the open internet, it's really two things, social and mobile. And so the first challenge I put out there is that the security community needs to get on board with the social and the mobile innovation space. We of course have to think about how do we protect social platforms and how do we defend our mobile devices. That's absolutely important. But what's almost more important is creating solutions in the security space that are in fact social and mobile themselves. Gone are the days when you can have firewalls and intrusion detection systems that the best way to communicate with an analyst is by sending them an email alert, right? If that's the only capability you had today on a social network, you'd think you were on a mailing list in the early 80s, right? It, it, it's just not practical in today's environment. So as we look at where the opportunity space is, I think the security community really has to get on board with these, um, these drivers of the open internet. Firewalls, IDS, uh, security information managers, and a variety of these other systems that are available need to have social components built into them. And we can already see where that might be important. I'll give you a simple example. We invest millions and millions of dollars in infrastructure and talent to defend against phishing attacks or attacks that try to manipulate users into clicking on links that they shouldn't or to steal information about their identity. And despite all of that investment, unfortunately, many of these attacks do get through and land on the user's inbox. Now you've got a situation where you've got a relatively untrained user dealing with a very sophisticated attack that overcame a lot of talent and a lot of investment, and you're leaving it up to them in isolation to make a decision, do I click or not? Do I forward this for help or not? If you had social tools built into your inbox, you would be able to see very clearly the context and the relative threat of the message. And we know that because we've done experiments in that regard. When you look at most phishing attacks, including spear phishing attacks, they have no social context. Right? They're not people you ordinarily communicate with. They're not businesses you ordinarily interact with. 
And even a relatively unsophisticated user can look at that and say, this doesn't belong. I probably shouldn't be responding to this message. But you need those kind of advanced social tools to be able to do that. And mobile's the same way. Um, the next opportunity space, I think, is in the workforce. Right now, today, um, we're still playing catch up with the basics of information assurance, the basics of cybersecurity. But the threat is, in fact, moving on. A number of the panelists are talking about that. Instead of just training people and preparing people for today's needs, we really need to prepare them for tomorrow's opportunities. We need innovators and entrepreneurs who are going to develop next generation security solutions and security companies. We don't need people to develop a next generation firewall. We need bright young students who are going to completely obsolete the firewall. Right? Five or ten years, you don't even have to implement one again. And so when we talk about that, there needs to be a solid business component in education. There needs to be a solid risk management component in education. And there really needs to be investment in entrepreneurs and in an ecosystem that fosters security innovation so that regardless of the threat, we can innovate outside of it, we can innovate around it, we can innovate past it. The last comment I'd like to make when it comes to cybersecurity in this space is around big data. One of the things we do know, again, going back to the internet as a communication medium, is that the more people who are able to communicate on it with more context and in more ways, the smarter we feel we are individually and the more compelling the experience is when we collaborate and communicate together. So we can look at uh, large sites like Facebook, right? 750 million people, sometimes hundreds of million concurrent users. When you have that much data at your disposal, about how people um, operate on a platform like that, you know pretty unequivocally what an average user looks like. That's very hard to do when you've got a population in your enterprise of 10 users or 10,000 users. And so the message there is that we have to start building big data and analytics systems that allow us to look across the internet, share information between enterprises, and collaborate in a social way so that we've got enough data to make good decisions about risk management in real time that provide the context users and operators need. And only the CISO, the Chief <coughs> Information Security Officer, is in a position to do that. And I'll give you a simple example where clicks are wasted in, in the enterprise. Uh, if you've ever shopped on a site like Amazon or any shopping site, it's very common to have two features, personalization right, and recommendations. Right? They know kind of who you are and what your tastes are, and therefore they can recommend books or toys or videos that might be of interest to you. The same could apply in the security enterprise and only the CISO has access to that information. If they know what your job is, what your education is, who your customers are, what your mission in the organization is, why aren't your information systems in your enterprise recommending good security practice, more efficient use of the systems, and access to features and functions, particularly in a large enterprise, that you as a new or relatively new employee had no idea existed? You've come to expect that when buying toys on the internet. Why don't you have those capabilities from a security and innovation standpoint in your enterprise? The CISO is the person who oversees all the identity and access management and is responsible for linking those systems securely. And they really sit at that nexus point of big data to be able to provide those capabilities. So uh, with that, a couple of ideas about innovation and entrepreneurship. And um, hope to see you guys out there doing it. Thank you very much. Ross, all, all you folks will, will, uh, are hard. All, all you folks will be able to answer some questions uh, a little later as we move along. Our next um, panelist is Bill Horner, who is the president and CEO, Mission Cyber and Technology Solutions for Mantech. Um, Bill, go ahead. Thank you, Ted. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. One of the pleasures of being the fourth speaker is that you get to listen to three people in front of you make all the points that you had spent most of yesterday <laughs> evening thinking about. And you have the challenge of seeing if you can adjust in real time and say something different. <laughs> or I can just say I agree with everybody and save everybody five minutes. But of course, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> but thank you for having me. Today, we use technology for just about everything we do. Having a wired phone in your house is becoming increasingly unnecessary. You can order your pizza online and watch it being delivered to your house step by step if you really want to do that. I know many people who hardly ever write checks anymore because they do online banking, myself included. Um, 
Former director of both NSA and DIA, General Ken Menahan, calls this time period we're living in the cyber age. He goes even a little bit further by noting that we're not in the cyber business, but rather we are doing business in the age of cyber. So I think of cyber not as an end to itself, but as an enabler for the way that I need to do business and all of us in this room need to do business today. It's hard to imagine any transaction today that does not rely on the internet, banking, credit card usage, even driving your car or controlling home appliances. Most of our nation's critical infrastructure is controlled over the internet, and most of that is over non-government networks. As government and business look for ways to become more efficient, technology plays a major role. And for long-term cost savings measures, wireless technology becomes more in demand, as does data storage and management. Because of our dependence on being online, protecting the internet and the domain of the internet has to be a priority. Our basic life as we know it today depends upon it. They're both tremendous opportunities and tremendous vulnerabilities created by network-enabled technologies. At Mantech, we're part of a small army whose goal is to protect our cyber networks and maintain their integrity. We're trying to win our battles every day, behind the scenes, quietly but aggressively. Unfortunately, there are more and larger armies out there looking to do harm to government and business networks. The traditional denial, disruption, and destruction are morphing into much more sophisticated forms of exfiltrating and stealing valuable intellectual property from the United States, both from government and private industry. In fact, some estimates say that one terabyte of data is stolen from the United States every single day. One terabyte. Just for reference purposes, the Library of Congress, the totality of all written material in the Library of Congress is 10 terabytes. So picture one tenth of the Library of Congress being stolen from the United States every single day. It's amazing. We're now in an age where the enemy does not have a specific face or front that we can mount directly against. The enemy to our personal information, our data, our infrastructure, and our national security lives in the shadows. Foreign enemies, criminal organizations, and rebellious independent hackers all threaten to steal our data, interrupt, or destroy our infrastructure. The field of cybersecurity is growing at every level of government and business, and rightfully so, with what's at stake. For example, this past May, Sony Online Entertainment was hacked. I'm sure everybody in the room read about that. Personal information, including names, addresses, and credit card numbers of nearly 26 million Sony user accounts were exposed. Now, in fairness, Sony acted very quickly. They took down the gaming service as soon as they learned of the attack, but the cost of the company, their reputation, and the risks they posed for their customers was higher than what most shareholders would care for. And this was on top of an additional hack earlier of nearly 70 million accounts to Sony PlayStation and Curiosity Services. So 2011 has been a banner year for cyber criminals and hacktivists. The year started with the widely publicized attacks on NASDAQ and H.P. Gary. The H.P. Gary case became famous because it combined social network exploitation with traditional cyber attacks. Many attacks and denial attempts were associated with the so-called Arab Spring. And then the big one, RSA, maker of the secure ID authentication tokens. I'm willing to bet that half the people in this room were among those 40 million people whose login credentials were compromised. Almost everybody, industry and government, uses RSA tokens in some form or another, and the whole system was compromised. We talked about Sony. There were three separate compromises resulting in a total of 102 million usernames, addresses, emails. Sony says credit card data was encrypted, so we might be okay. The RSA attack led to tax on two major defense contractors, resulting in thousands of sensitive documents being exposed. And that's just a sampling of 2011 so far. And the year is not over, as, as people have pointed out. 
So we're looking at major incidents, and my fear is that when we look back on 2011, 2011 will go down as the year of the hacker. So let's make 2012 the year of the solution. There is hope. There are a number of things out there that are happening that we can take comfort in. First of all, in July, the Department of Defense released the, De the Defense Department strategy for operating in cyberspace. It includes five pillars, including operationalizing cyberspace, active defenses, critical infrastructure protection, international cooperation, and training and technology. This document or this operating manual attempts to define how the United States will operate in cyberspace. Very much needed the first time this has ever been done. The second thing that's very positive out there is actually the United States marketplace. The marketplace has come to the aid of cybersecurity, in my opinion, providing incentives for startup companies, small new companies, and established companies as well to develop innovative security strategies and products. And as any of you all who are paying attention to the growth of small cyber companies these days are aware, you see readily that the marketplace is providing opportunities. I think the third positive thing is that the publicity of all these attacks that we've just talked about has focused corporate IT and security organizations to do a much better job of protecting their networks. And finally, there are many cyber security bills pending in the 112th Congress, including requirements for continuous monitoring and reporting of cyber incidents. So in summary, cyber threats are as limitless as the boundaries of the internet. Current and future cyber professionals are the guardians of the cyber age, and our ability to train and prepare them to defend our most important information resources will define the real impact and cost of the various steps we're seeing. In the cybersecurity industry, and we've talked about this a little bit, in the Baltimore, Washington corridor, there is negative unemployment in the cybersecurity industry. I'm sure that I speak for all the panelists when I say that we at Mantec cannot find as many cybersecurity specialists as we need. To try to compensate for that, we've been working with universities. Um, a prime example is our work with the University of Maryland, where we're trying to ensure that students receive the education that makes them suitable to be hired by all of us as cybersecurity engineers, as well as being hired by the government. There's nothing more essential to our nation's future than ensuring our readiness to protect and defend our critical infrastructure, national security information, and to stop the loss of intellectual property. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's a great transition. I'm going to use the um, benefit of being a moderator and move on and continue with the panel. Uh, then we'll have our guest speaker, and then we'll open it up to question because that's a great transition. So um, I'd like to have Bob Hannon who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Anne Arundel County Economic Development uh, uh, Department. I have a little bit of pride in Bob, and I think I got him started in this business when I was County Executive, and we created the first Department of Economic Development for the county, and Bob worked for us then. Bob? Gee, Ted, how long ago was that? Uh, don't, don't talk about that. <laughs> oh, and he worked for Dutch as well, good. <laughs> <laughs> Ted, thank you very Wait much. Wait a minute, how comes I have all the gray hair? <laughs> Ted, thanks very much to, to you um, as well as for Carter uh, A for bringing this group together. And um, my kind of comments uh, will go towards uh, kind of the economic implications of, of all of this in terms of the, uh, of the business community. Um, and I wanted to link that uh, perhaps back to comments that uh, Congressman Sarbanes made in his open remarks. That is the absolute re uh, uh, necessity, imperative, that in fact collaboration take place amongst all the parties that are linked to this issue. As much as it is a, an, an opportunity, it presents many, many, many challenges in order for it to be successful. And the fact that uh, you can put together a group like this in this room and if you look around the, uh, each of the tables, 
Uh, you can go table by table and see folks that already have a stake in this issue, already have a commitment in, firm, in terms of whether their discipline is the education institutions or private industry, uh, federal government, state government, uh, even at the local government. When I think about the issues that we deal with in Anne Arundel County, and I know that uh, on, uh, twice a month we go before the county council and we need to have enlightened leadership uh, at all levels to make certain they understand the importance of all of this and make certain their decision making is, uh, is dedicated to uh, the betterment of the country and certainly the betterment of their, their communities. There's four quick points that I want to talk about uh, under this banner of collaboration. Uh, workforce, you can't go into a meeting dealing with technology, technology development, uh, national security, that one of the topics that comes up immediately was the uh, imperative that in fact we educate, we train, uh, we build the pipeline for the quality of disciplined knowledge that's necessary to go into the workforce, whether it's on the public side or, or on the private side. And there's a, uh, many examples uh, where, I mean, Kerry certainly has brought um, to bear some of the local efforts at the community college level that adopted this issue of cybersecurity as one of their primary initiatives. And uh, Dr. Smith is, is here who's been working with the college to garner resources to make certain that we support at the community college level, at the appropriate level, not only the education um, at the uh, AA degree level, but also the certifications that are necessary to kind of build those technicians in at the level of both government and, uh, uh, and private business. Um, I want to talk about issues of innovation and entrepreneurship. One of the great, great opportunities that are coming as a result of this is the ability to collaborate with those thought leaders, those entrepreneurs, those engineers, those scientists, that whether they're in their waking hours or their subconscious levels, are constantly working that brain power in producing new knowledge and taking that new knowledge and finding the proper applications of that knowledge. We have some great examples where we've got work already underway, uh, not just within one county, but within the entire region, that are really kind of fostering and supporting that entrepreneurship and that innovation. Certainly, um, the Technology Development Corporation of, of the state, John Watson is here, uh, dedicated to taking new ideas and knowledge and providing commercial applications for it, and providing funding to support those companies uh, that are uh, on that path. In Anne Arundel County, we have the Chesapeake Innovation Center, a really kind of a small, early stage incubator institution that is working well beyond its means in terms of attracting innovation from nationally. Literally working the network of national incubators, trying to match the entrepreneurs within the, the national network uh, of, of entrepreneurs that have direct application to both business and government here, bringing those companies here and putting them before panels of both private industry, uh, federal government, to process what they have, give them feedback, and by cherry picking the best of the best, bringing those companies here to grow their companies and to make their product and their trained talent available to the, uh, to the effort that's taking place here. Um, a third point is the, uh, the engagement of small business. Uh, we've got uh, a great network of groups that are looking to take the entrepreneurs, take the early stage companies, and match them with the prime contractors. To take that, uh, that long process, that uh, winnowing process of making certain that we create efficiencies in the, uh, that knowledge has been created and put them to work on this, uh, this uh, effort in cybersecurity. And I would point to the, the BRAC Business Initiative that Howard County uh, has started. Ken Menser is here. And he's got a, a group that has something, something like 17 active members that have uh, business acumen that are looking to apply that into this, uh, this major effort. Uh, the Mead Business Connect, the Fort Mead Alliance, and, and their effort to develop business opportunities are matching small business uh, in uh, clusters of training mentored by the major prime contractors. Um, 
the Small Business Resource Center and the um, Maryland PTAC program, providing procurement technical assistance for small businesses to match them up with the outreach uh, on these major contracts. Um, I'm sure Mark is going to speak from the efforts that the uh, National Security Agency has that um, has very specific outreach to get small businesses involved in the work of the, of the agency for, through their art program, through their um, business and admitted programs with, with small business. So there's a great network of collaborators already at work trying to work on behalf of the larger national interests, but at the same time being driven by their own, own special interests of entrepreneurship uh, in this um, capitalist uh, world that we live in. So those are some of the major points that I think that are some of the implications of this larger effort, and I think that there is um, a great effort that's already in place. Uh, you can tell it by the interest uh, in this topic and the participation here, but as one of the earlier speakers says, it's never enough. Uh, you, can't, you can't be satisfied with a grade C plus or B. It's got to be A's right across the board, and it takes a concerted effort by all of us to make this a, a success. Thank you. Bob, thank you very much. I know there are going to be a lot of questions for you guys, so sit tight. Um, how about Chris Foster next? Chris is the business development executive for Raytheon. Well, I thought it was going to be last, but this well, is going to get starry guys you're out of the picture. <laughs> you know, I'll kind of maybe give a slightly different take on it. Uh, so we spend a lot of money, of course, defending our own network. Um, Raytheon's got about 75,000 employees or something like that. And one thing that I can tell you statistically, as much as we have a high end educated workforce and we really, really work at this, and this sounds crazy, but about 10% of your employees will actually click on anything that they get in their email. I mean, you could have flashes <coughs> and arrows at something that's a web link that says malware. 10% of your people will not believe that, think it's a joke, and click on it. So if you have a company that has more than one employee other than you, <laughs> there's a potential. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I live that every day. It just amazes me. It's like, you know that thing was malware. Really? So that's one of the metrics I would throw out there. The other thing is, because I, I kind of run that business development organization across Raytheon, across all of our customers, DOD, Intel, Fed, Civil, and all that thing, I get to interact with a lot of customers, and I can tell you unequivocally, and as part of the U.S. policy, in general, we don't just, in general, we don't just go attack people, right? But if you think about your own house, let's say if someone was throwing a rock at your windows, do you buy more glass, do you put shutters up? Or do you dial 911, or at some point do you go out there and make them stop, right? Well, in general, we spend most of our money on defense. It's just U.S. policy. And across all these customers, I will tell you, 90% of what they spend budget-wise is on defense. That's our policy. That's what we do. And a few of the speakers have talked about that. It's, it's where it is. So if you're in that business, just keep that in mind. Yes, the cool stuff is in the other end of it. Uh, if you've seen any of the, let's see, the Bruce Willis movie where they did the fire sale, what they do, they hired a bunch of young hackers, they all developed little tools, they brought them together and they launched attack. Yeah, that's the cool, I did some encryption algorithm and, and hacked the social security. Okay, 90% is on defense, not on that, right? That's just the way the world works. Um, what was the other one that was really good? James Bond, Quantum of Solace, right? I don't know if you got anybody you know, saw that movie, there's a little scene in there, very subtle. James Bond hands someone his business card. The guy goes, hmm, who is that guy at our gate? dials up the phone number, there's kind of a recording that goes on and a handshake, it downloads a little something to his phone, and James Bond's tracking the guy's GPS for the rest of the movie. Oh, come on. Is that a scalable business model? Probably not, right? <laughs> it's, again, what's going on in the real world? Um, let's see, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. We've, probably most of us have read those books. Daniel Craig's in the new movie, so you get to see James Bond as uh, that guy. It's all about the girl who's the hacker, right? She's doing the neat, sexy, cool stuff. That's like one-tenth of one percent of the market, right? So let me tell you what I really wanted to talk about. It was a really exciting new business model. You guys that have known me for a long time know I love that startup world. Did a couple of them. I see my former boss in the audience when I was in that world. So I've got three people. I've got a VP of client services, a VP of um, provider services, and a CFO. So we're kind of scaling up the organization. So. Let me tell you about the VP of client services. That person is really out there to get new customers. It's a healthcare business. I was in that before. So they're out there getting new customers. And our real target audience is that Medicare audience. I'm not quite there yet. But, you know, for those of you who might be your future customer, right? 
And then I have a, a VP of provider services that's trying to build our provider network. So they're going after doctors that will join our practice. Well, really all they really want is their actual ID numbers. We don't really want the doctor. It's a virtual business, right? So we're going to provide virtual health care. And then we uh, have a finance person who's going to do all this, right? And actually when I said we wanted patients, we don't really want the patients. We are really all we want is their Medicare numbers. I mean, that's all we really need, right? The really slick part of this is what we do is we have like a GIS application and we have a, the CFO has this billing application. So once we get all the doctor's numbers and then we have the Medicare numbers of the patients, then what we do is we have this application that goes through and generates billing information for patients because we know what kind of a patient they are and we know where they live. So our GIS application will make sure that we don't get caught by Medicare fraud people and we'll generate billing for these guys. That's really not quite out of the abnormal thing. It'll be like they came in for this checkup, they came in and got this procedure, they came in and did this thing. And as we scale this thing out, we can have multiple virtual provider networks and it's a really scalable business model, right? And it only takes like, we've got like 30 employees and we're generating about $15 million a month in revenue. I mean, think about it. An average bank robbery is $1,000 and you've got guns involved and you're going to prison. <laughs> What's the risk here? <laughs> I mean, what are they going to do? Shut us down and maybe give me a $5,000 fine in six months of jail? I mean, when you think about the cybercrime implications of this, I do a lot of business in the UK. and They're much more focused on, obviously I'm joking a little bit, and I'll tell you the punchline in a second. The UK actually has a whole business that they call the Serious Organized Crime Unit. And it seems like I met these guys, I'm like, is there a lackadaisical or a mediocre or a you know, kickback organized? It's organized crime, it's serious, right? It's just kind of funny, it's the Brits and their sense of humor. Their organized crime thing is huge compared to here. And it's partly proximity, but it's how, it's just, and they spend a lot of resources on organized crime here. So the scenario I was actually kind of jokingly talking to you guys about, the FBI busted those guys last September of last year. And when they busted them, this was a group of 30 people that immigrated from Northern Europe legally. They had been in the country less than six months from, start, I mean, talk about those of you who have done startups like, you know, like yours. These guys in less than six months did $45 million in net profit. $45 million. I mean, how many banks you'd have to rob to do that? Right? And what happened to them? Almost every one of them got deported. Big deal. And if you think about the defense world, it takes actually a bigger entry workforce. It's people sitting at terminals who respond to things and go out and fix things. And then they get their CISSP, they get their CNA, they get their CCIE, they get all the certs, and then they move up, maybe they get their degree. There's actually so many Ken Zadikos at the top, right, Ken? There's only so many guys that have PhDs that are doing the really, really cool stuff, but there's a big workforce out there, and there's room for everybody. We just gotta, gotta get moving. All right. Chris, this is cyber crime stuff. Are there uh, job opportunities there that we ought to be looking at? Hey, I'm looking at it. <laughs> you want to join me or <laughs> You want a partnership here? Actually, there's, it's, it's huge. And, and I have a lot of friends in the Bureau as well that I've worked with. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. There's, there's kind of two pieces of it. There's, uh, in fact, the FBI, and I won't tell you where, they have a whole building here in Maryland just dedicated to sci uh, pornography, child pornography alone, just the child piece of it. It's, it's, it's sick how big that is, the resource we have to put against it. And then the cyber crime port portion of it is multiples bigger than that. It, it's, there's a lot of job opportunity in law enforcement, um, everything from, you know, uh, our attorney general talked about it, what they're doing in Maryland. Uh, it goes from state and local all the way up to federal. In fact, the Bureau would tell you there's not a single crime committed that they're investigating that doesn't involve a computer. They, I know they've gone to the fort for some of these to ask for help. They are so overwhelmed because anytime you bust somebody, I mean, think about when you see this stuff, Casey Anthony does other trials, it was email, it was what she was doing on Google, what she was researching, right? Every crime they investigate, everybody has a cell phone, a smartphone, or a computer, and they need evidence off that stuff. It, it's, it's overwhelming. Thank you, Chris. Our next speaker is Jim Richardson, the head of the uh, Economic Development uh, Office in Harford County. Jim. Well, thank you. So someone that Mr. Bennett told us. Uh, I can say from Harvard County, it's uh, great to be sitting at the big kids' table. So, <laughs> so, uh, well, you guys are big kids up there now, uh, okay? I so. so I, I often was thinking. Right <coughs> so, uh, uh, and of course, you know, because often uh, as we come here, you know, we we talk a lot about this when we've uh, had our meetings. Everybody knows there's you know Washington and Montgomery, PG, and around the county down here. 
uh, Howard, Baltimore, and everybody knows what's going to Baltimore City, right? <coughs> Philadelphia. So, <laughs> that's why we're coming here, to make sure it all works together. So uh, we are just north of Baltimore City, right below the Susquehanna. Uh, we have a little thing called BRAC that is done, and we're very glad to be, uh, be part of that process. And I think it brings a, a new, uh, new, new twist to the state of Maryland. And certainly, as we look at the cybersecurity and a lot of what people have been talking about here on this panel, uh, we believe that uh, particularly Aberdeen Proving Ground will uh, play a major role. We've actually a lot of friends from uh, Hartford County here. We just had a ribbon cutting from Mantech the other day. Uh, Jim Fielder's here, uh, keeps us honest up there a little bit, uh, SAIC and others uh, that uh, we're very glad uh, to have in, uh, uh, in, our, uh, in, our, in our domain these days. Um, how does Aberdeen Proving Ground fit into cybersecurity? <laughs> Uh, with the BRAC of 2005, of course, we uh, received our largest uh, 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 staff uh, switch was with the, the Communications and Electronics Command out of Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. They voted that 5,300 uh, positions. Uh, totally, we will have uh, 8,500 new federal positions at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, when I look at just the total uh, 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 grouping of uh, uh, economic development engines in the state of Maryland, uh, you look at the number of people uh, people hire. You take Fort Meade and NSA, it's about 42,000 people, and it's certainly the largest. Uh, second behind that is University of Maryland system, with about 30,000 people. Tied at fourth, at, uh, for a third, is actually Johns Hopkins University, uh, the university system, not counting the hospital, about 25,000, and then comes out the improving ground with 25,000 employees. And that does not count our defense contractors, uh, which we're welcoming to the community. So when you talk about jobs, uh, we currently have uh, 8,500 positions on post, of which there's only 6,300 that are, are, come, are filled today. So they're actually uh, going through this uh, uh, congressman. We need to get this budget figured out so we can get these jobs sorted out. I know you're working on that, but they're hiring some, firing others, and so we're all, all working on these things, so it's very critical. Uh, you know, we stood up, I'm very happy that uh, many of my staff are here with me, uh, and Karen Holt, our manager of Chesapeake Science and Security Quarter, we're going to have a little event next week uh, to kind of celebrate the end of BRAC, uh, but has done a great job at regionalizing what we're doing uh, uh, with that. And, and uh, Mr. Hannon talked about partnerships and working on regional connectivity, and I think that's critical, because their jobs will be from Washington to Aberdeen, and people will transfer in uh, seamlessly. In fact, a lot of people will be working at Aberdeen and NSA on the same equipment. What's different about Aberdeen and uh, the other installations in Maryland? Uh, we believe that we are critical to the cybersecurity corridor that's being developed in Maryland. We need a state plan to do that and make that happen. Uh, we know we're talking about it and we think it's, it's critical. Uh, and, uh, but what's different is we're a little more on the hardware side. Uh, when we're talking about the cell phone and Putting and following the GPS, those were my folks up at Aberdeen that created that technology. Uh, the folks at Fort Monmouth actually created the technology, uh, they created GPS and GIS. Uh, and I don't think there's any debate about that. There's not a who created the internet. They actually created GIS and GPS technologies at Fort Monmouth. Uh, their legacy systems of Bell Labs, uh, AT&T, are now down at Aberdeen Proving Ground and others. Uh, and we'll be working to create the technology. Uh, looking at how we interrelate with Mead and NSA, uh, one, of the, one of the largest components is the uh, C2 uh, IEWNS, and that's Communications and, and Control Int Intelligence and Electronic Warfare Systems. That's all information and gathering in remote locations uh, by means that uh, we can use in the United States, but uh, very often we have to use it in uh, foreign countries. But that's the ability to track uh, uh, people, uh, you know, at different and sundry places. We need engineers, electrical engineers, computer engineers, uh, systems programmers, uh, everything along that line, going back to STEM education, to create the, the mass for these researchers. Uh, again, concentrating on the uh, uh, workforce uh, analogy, uh, we're not seeing uh, as much movement. Uh, a lot of people are moving down from New Jersey. A lot of them are renting houses and learning townhouses and apartments and things like that uh, for a while because many of them were within five years of retirement. In fact, all the people uh, of all the workforce at APG, of which it's about 25,000, over 50% of them will be eligible for retirement in five years. So we have a 10,000, 12,000 job replacement process. In the economy, it might be five years, it might be six years, seven years, but we're going to see that replacement 
occur. And let's think about it. Uh, I was on a panel the other day, and, and when, did when did the digital age come about? And somebody told me that digital was a block was embedded in 1973. That's when me, uh, that's when a lot of the, uh, the uh, digital uh, agencies started to be, began to be stood up. So 1973, we're now in 2013, everybody's, you know, 30, 40 years out in their career. So retirement is going to come along. So we're going to have a, a large gap in, uh, 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 in hiring new employees uh, from uh, fitting this retirement the picture. Uh, in closing, I'm just very glad to be here. I look forward to answering questions. Uh, you know, we are a, a major player, I believe, at uh, Aberdeen and Hartford County in this cybersecurity uh, arena. Uh, one of the th two things that we're looking at as we go forward post prac is transportation, our transportation in industry, and education. Uh, we need a university research uh, program uh, in northeastern Maryland uh, to begin to work with this. Right now, this C4ISR community uh, is uh, a 26 billion dollar billion has 26 billion dollars in research monies uh, to be done on C4ISR uh, programs. Uh, not just a simple country boy, Bob Tate with C4ISR. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, all suspicious of poor country boys, believe me. <laughs> We're really honored to have our next uh, panelist um, here with us, um, who represents a remarkable agency that has a big, big impact on our state, uh, Mark Barnett, who is the Director of Small Business Programs at the National Security Agency. Mark? Thanks, Ted. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It's great to be here. We always appreciate the opportunity to uh, get out from behind our, our cloaks of secrecy, et cetera, and get out into the community. You look like an ordinary citizen. We are ordinary <laughs> And Dutch, I know you're on a tight schedule. I'll make this real, real quick. Um, I do have three folks from my office here today, and, and these events always work out to be great networking opportunities for us. So if any of you would like to talk to any of us about engaging the agency or some of the things that are going on, Jim Higgins is here. He's our Associate Director for Programs. We do have a small business set-aside program. It's about an $800 million program. Jim heads that up and a few other things. Um, Margaret Griffin is new to the agency. She's one of our outreach advocates. And Heather McCall is our associate director for outreach and events. So if any of you have anything that you'd like to talk about or approach us afterwards, please feel free to do so. I'm very happy to report that NSA's uh, support and engagement of the business community, and especially the small business community, is alive and well. Um, we continue to have many proactive programs to engage small businesses, and as I think uh, everyone knows, the emphasis on small business growth and small business employment uh, is a big, big item today in the news in terms of trying to drive the economy. Um, we do, as I think many of you know, no public procurements. So the path to engage us and to do business with us is very different than it is at any other federal agency. Uh, that you may encounter. So part of the mission of our office is really to help you and to facilitate your positioning to do business with the agency. Uh, part of this idea of not having public procurements is we have our own resource center, our acquisition resource center. Uh, as of last week, we had 10,326 companies registered in the ARC, so competition is heavy. Um, if you use the 80-20% rule, you can assume about 80% of that 10,000 are small businesses. So again, my office tries to help to the degree that we can position the small businesses to compete for NSA business. I have a new statistic that we put together because uh, everybody likes statistics and especially in the small business world, we're, we're looked at in many cases in terms of our, our prime contract dollars and what we put out uh, through NSA prime contracts into the community. It's really not a full representation or a truthful representation of what we actually do in the community. So I went out a few weeks ago and engaged a bunch of our large contractors and got some subcontracting statistics from them and then we kind of did a statistical analysis and I can report to you that about 48 cents, somewhere between 45 and 50 cents of every dollar that we contract out at NSA goes into the small business community. Not all direct on prime contracts, but most of that, in fact, the greater majority goes through the subcontracting of companies like SAIC, Mantech, and Raytheon. So 
this is a very, very important organization in terms of the community support. I think you all know that we are the largest employer in the state of Maryland and also the largest consumer of power in the state of Maryland. Some, some very quick uh, things that we're looking at, uh, obviously uh, small business utilization in terms of how do we improve that. And I know that my, uh, my, my friends up here in the large businesses may not like to hear this, but we're looking, our, our business tends to be very large contracts. And it's very difficult for small businesses to, to actually compete for those because they're in the hundreds of millions of dollars we don't know a whole lot of small businesses that are in that you know, economic range. So what we're looking at is we're looking at seeing if we can do carve-outs. Can we take some of those contract requirements and can we pull them out of this overarching requirement and set those aside for small business? Um, and that's one of the things that we're really trying and we're working hard to do. The other thing is uh, innovation has really come to the forefront for us. How can we identify those businesses and those technologies that are going to help us close our, our gaps and address a lot of these issues that were expressed up here? How can we do that more quickly and how can we get rid of all the red tape that's involved with doing business with the government bureaucracy? So those are things that we're really focusing on. Uh, again, thanks for having us, Ted. We appreciate this. And, and please, uh, if any of you want to talk further about doing business with us, you can go to nsa.gov, contact the Office of Small <coughs> Business, or we'll be happy to meet with you here. Thanks very much. Uh, Mark, just out of curiosity, did you guys lose power during the recent hurricane? <laughs> <laughs> I say not. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Our, our final speaker, our panelist. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> our final speaker, and that's a good segue from what uh, uh, Mark was saying, is uh, Rick Core. Uh, Rick is the uh, president of Evergreen's advisor and is, uh, uh, has a remarkable venture capital. Of, uh, firm. So, Rick, go ahead. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, wonderful group of people here that we've been surrounded with. Um, I am about 10 minutes from NSA. I think most of the earthquake shake was forced over my way, and we got more than our fair share. Um, what's interesting uh, from my perspective, we come at it a little bit differently. I'm not a government contractor, not, a, uh, not with the uh, NSA, not uh, from the government perspective. Uh, the amount of effort and energy that I'm seeing uh, from uh, where we sit is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, in the last um, 10 years, the changes that have taken place uh, in, in the industry are pretty, uh, pretty astounding. We started our angel fund back in 2002, invested in 11 companies, and I don't think we saw any cyber security uh, company present to us except maybe the last year or two. Uh, and, and I've read a couple of books about uh, the technology and, and how it's used and, and been rolled out uh, over the centuries here from the steam engine to the car to the you know to obviously the internet among other things in the first 10 years the folks that kind of come in and they kind of stake their claim but most of them lose lose their money and lose their shirt uh, 10 years thereafter you really see uh, an adaption of that technology and uh, I, I think we're clearly seeing that at this point. I still go back to the AOL account and you, you turn on the, the computer and the modem kicked in. So uh, seen a lot of changes in the last 10 years. Uh, I've been fortunate uh, to serve for Kent uh, on the uh, Howard County Cyber Commission and uh, see a, a litany of different data points uh, in the cyber area. And what I'm intrigued by is just the explosion of ideas. And, and, and it's not just uh, you know, necessarily focused in the cybersecurity area. It morphs over a litany of different industries from healthcare and you know, uh, trying to create identity uh, capabilities to mitigate Medicare fraud to the financial services when you're now doing applications on the mobile phone uh, to even communications, uh, biotech. There's some applications there and clearly in the intelligence uh, area as well. And what's interesting is all those ideas, um, you know, create needs. And the needs, as you've heard this morning, uh, vary from people uh, having the right skill sets, having security clearances, uh, being accessible in the region. Uh, we've, we've heard studies uh, with Aberdeen Proving Ground, uh, the number of uh, employees coming in there, 40,000 plus. Uh, Fort Meade, I've heard numbers as high as 55,000. 
uh, and the people just aren't, aren't in our area. So there's a great opportunity there from an economic growth perspective to create, uh, create that talent starting as early as the middle school, elementary school level, making sure that our kids are uh, being uh, immersed in that capability. We're watching schools, uh, higher education, I know Loyola is starting a master's program in cybersecurity, more geared towards the management aspect. Uh, UNBC, uh, Rick Garrett's had uh, a great event with Cyber Maryland uh, about uh, two weeks ago down at UNBC with the incubator. Uh, I know a number of the other uh, higher education uh, institutions are working in that area. I heard Maryland, University of Maryland touched on this morning. So the people aspect is, is going to continue to be critical uh, from that perspective. Uh, secondly, it takes money, and when the companies that we look at invariably are looking to raise capital, uh, they're at a point where they've started the company, they've built it with chewing gum, duct tape, uh, shoestrings, credit cards, friends and family, and that can only take you so far. Uh, there, is a, there is money out there for the more mature companies, the banks, the, the mezzanine lenders, among others. Uh, and there's access in the VC space uh, as well for the more, um, you know, the more seasoned companies uh, too. There's a gap in there in the early stage area, and I think um, I saw Christian walk in uh, did a remarkable job in really trying to jumpstart that space uh, and creating dollars that will be available through Invest Maryland uh, that'll, that'll hopefully seed some other funds and create some economic growth from that perspective. We see literally uh, dozens of companies that are out looking to try to raise money and they're in that early stage area and there's just not a lot of access to capital for these great ideas that will really help us protect our infrastructure and create great ideas and move this country along. And then the third kind of key component is when you, when you have these great ideas, you need people, you need money, and you need infrastructure. Uh, you need buildings, you need roads. You need uh, unique capabilities in regards to skiffs and, and those kind of things. So I think from my perspective, uh, I'm seeing a great opportunity for everybody in this region, uh, irrespective of where you're looking at the, the globe uh, from an economic growth perspective. And, and there are a lot of people doing some great things in the area, ranging from Cyber Maryland to Invest Maryland, uh, Mark Barnett here to my left is incredibly accessible. We've had a number of clients that we've sat down and had breakfast with Mark trying to figure out how to engage the agency and what are the opportunities from that perspective. Uh, we touched on the incubators, uh, some of the things going on in the tech transfer area that are very, very powerful. Uh, and, and our government officials are very, very accessible and uh, I think doing a great job of trying to make sure that we take advantage of this opportunity that's been handed handed to us with that would be improving ground and Fort Meade and just cybersecurity in general, which touches on so many other different aspects outside the federal government. Uh, I'm excited about what's uh, what's happening, and I hope we, uh, we we can take advantage of that over the next decade or two. Thank you very much, Rick. I'd like to give this panel a big round of applause. It really is a terrific treat. Two things. <clears throat> We're going to hear from our keynote speaker in just a moment. We've got to set up a PowerPoint.